Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about anything about the Beatles, their past, the present, whatever we feel like in the moment. And uh, I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of this show. And many of you know me from my other weekly Beatles program, a syndicated show on the Beatles called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by some of my regular co-hosts on the show at this time out. First of all, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also one of the writers for Beatle Fan, who's been with them since the very beginning of the magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. Ken, let me say one, th- one quick thing. Uh, yeah. I know we're going to, this will be uh, on way after the fact, but I just want to say happy John Meets Paul Day, guys. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Okay. <laughs> okay. There we go. And, yeah. in, and, and in advance, happy 75th birthday to Ringo. Of course, by the time you folks hear this, it'll be after the fact, but he will all, he will be 75 years old. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I will be I will be celebrating tomorrow. That's right. It's all Ringo Day. Yeah. And also, uh, I'm sorry to say that one of our regulars, our resident musicologist, Alan Cozen, uh, unfortunately he has some health issues to attend to, and he's not able to make our show this time out. So we all wish him well, and we hope he'll be with us on our next show. And uh, we have a special guest with us on the phone. His name is Andrew Grant Jackson. He is the author of a book that came out earlier this year. It's called 1965, The Most Revolutionary Year in Music. And ironically, it's funny that we have Andrew on because Al has been posting since January 1st this year on Facebook a video of a song that he, the way he explains it, is one of the reasons why 1965 was the greatest year in music. So obviously, Al and Andrew, you are of like minds. And so uh, I'm wondering if, uh, before we talk to Andrew, Al, did you have any idea that Andrew's book was coming out? And Actually, I do, because uh, uh, Andrew and I talked at the L.A. Fest uh, for Beatles fans last October, and he mentioned that, uh, that he had a new book coming out about 1965, which immediately you know, got my, uh, the attention of my antenna, uh, because mm. for decades... Uh, as Ken well knows, uh, I've been saying that 1965 is the single greatest year in the history of rock and roll. And on New Year's Day, kind of just sort of uh, very organically, I said, you know what? We're now into the 50th anniversary year. Maybe it's time that I put my uh, two cents where my mouth is and actually begin showing why 1965 is the greatest uh, year in the history of rock and roll. So beginning at, in chronological order, not in any kind of uh, rating, but strictly in chronological order, beginning with Reparata and the Del Rons, whenever a teenager cries, uh, I began <laughs> posting each day a YouTube clip of a song that, uh, that I consider to be one of the 365 reasons why 1965 is the the single greatest year in the history of rock and roll. Okay, so why don't I start by asking the two of you the very basic question of why you feel that way. And I must admit, look, I, I, I love the 60s. I love every part of the 60s. I love the pre-Beatles era, too. And, uh, you know, for, for so many reasons, I could, I could probably mention 1964 or 1967 and, or any year there and give you a reason why I feel that year was so tremendous. So what is it about that particular year for both of you that stands out why you feel the way you do that it was the greatest year in, in, in pop music? We'll start with you, Andrew. Well, yeah, I'm a huge fan of every year in the 60s, too, you know, 66. 67 but you know 68 but i think all those years they're kind of building on the innovations that really kicked into gear in 65 so i wouldn't personally say like yeah i think it's personally what's the best to somebody but i i was just making the case that this was the most revolutionary year because new forms of like lyrics for rock and roll and sounds and genres all really started uh, exploding in that year Mm-hmm. That that later years they built on this like a uh, psychedelia you know Sergeant Pepper you can trace a lot of the things from there from 
you know, sitar to orchestration and everything back to the uh, all the groundbreaking things the Beatles and Beach Boys started doing in uh, 65. Okay. And Al, how about you? Uh, sort of uh, launching off what Andrew was just saying. In 1965, you have the British invasion at really the, the first wave of the British invasion at its height. Uh, Andrew, I believe there was a week in June May. or July when, uh, when I believe there were eight, I think you would uh, point it out, there were eight songs by May British 8. acts. I'm looking at my uh, little uh, timeline at the beginning of the book, my little cheat right. sheet here is May 8th. Yes. Uh, eight, eight British, British invasion singles, and, and one of them was Australian. I think the only American right, right. one was, uh, what was it, Count Me In? <laughs> Ironically titled. Right. Uh, Gary Lewis and the Playboys. Gary Lewis and the Playboys, right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you have the British invasion at really uh, high tide, in, in, at least in the, the first wave. Then you have this, you have really the, in effect, the invention of folk rock uh, in the spring with uh, the release of the Bird's cover of Mr. Tambourine Man and then their first album plus Dylan's move to uh, to electric electric sound uh, then you've also got this whole new wave of bands that it, that were created or whose sound developed in the wake of the Beatles uh, the, as I said, this whole generate new generation of of bands that had formed or who had formulated their sound in the wake of the success, the initial success in America of the Beatles and the other British bands. Uh, you have the McCoys, you have the Sir Douglas Quintet, a group that even though they were from uh, they were from Texas, kind of fashioned themselves as an English type band, as did. The Bull Brummels, who were a group from mm -hmm. San Francisco. Uh, so you have that. You have uh, this, the beginning of the golden era of, uh, of as we call it back then, soul music with uh, Motown uh, beginning really. It's, it's real in the midst of its golden era. Uh, you have the first, the first real stirrings at Stax. Uh, plus uh, uh, so many other uh, artists, uh, Wilson Pickett, James Brown, uh, Fontella Bass, albeit a one-hit wonder, but still a classic record uh, in Rescue Me. Uh, so things like that. And uh, you also have classic records from the Beach Boys uh, that were setting the stage for the, the, the great, musical leaps that Brian Wilson be, would be making in 1966 and 67. Uh, so you have all of that, uh, plus a lot more that I'm, uh, that I'm not even really uh, thinking of. It seemed like every week there would be some new, great new record that mm -hmm. you'd be hearing on one of the top 40 radio stations of the day. Mm -hmm. well, one of the big things, too, that uh, you could throw in there would be a James Brown inventing funk, you know, with Papa's got a mm -hmm. brand new bag that became like the, the you know, the groundwork for hip hop and all that later to come. Yeah. Can I make a comment? The, the uh, 1965 actually was kind of an American explosion. And part of the reason may have been um, something I found um, in uh, in reading today, that American authorities drastically cut the number of work permits given to UK groups, which um, gave people like the Bo Brummels and Gary Lewis and the Playboys and a lot of others, you know, a little more uh, room to to come out there and and to and to uh, you know uh, get popular, which is really interesting that. That they had, that the authorities had done that. You know, I, I get, I get. You know, you could kind of speculate the reason for that, but uh, whether they were trying to keep the, you know, the British groups down, or whether they were trying to make way for the American groups, or whatever. But uh, that was interesting. That I, I don't recall ever hearing that before. Did either of you guys ever hear that one before? Well. Conversely, I think Andrew may have touched on that in the book because conversely, that. Uh, that ruling greatly retarded 
uh, the the kinks ability kinks, yeah. to gain gain much of a foothold in this country, right, Andrew? Yeah, there was. Um, they had all these run-ins when their summer tour. Like, uh, I, I think he was a representative from the uh, the musicians' union. Started needling Ray Davies, I guess, about his wife. I, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember. If she was Lithuanian, but like of Eastern European, and he started saying mm-hmm. is she a communist, and so uh, Ray shoved him or something, and that. So that got them banned. That plus, you know, uh, they were dancing. A couple of the kinks were dancing cheek to cheek on like hullabaloo <laughs> TV oh show, which freaked out people because they had long hair. And, you know, they kind of they put on a little extra of fayness sometimes, you know. So, uh, wow, you know, there was they there was, a, uh, you know, they, he also they with customs, they had a little bit of run ins like, are you a boy or a girl? And he goes something like, oh, yeah, and that's my sister. <laughs> you know, they were just really smart asses to everybody, and it kind of got them in some hot water. Hmm. They all, John Gacy, the serial killer, had him over for her drinks, <laughs> too. He was like the uh, the local committee. I forget. It was like the, uh, you know, like not the not the VA, but, you know, some sort of local, what do you call those, you know, like a, just a community group. And he, he brought the group over to have drinks. But they got a little creeped out by him, you know that serial killer who make the paintings of the clowns. Uh, what's it? John Wayne Gacy? And, and, and so they left, and they found out later that 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 serial killer had had him over to their house for uh, after show entertainment. Wow. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, for all of our listeners, we will be talking about the Beatles pretty soon in this conversation. <laughs> yes, I, you know, just in case, just in case anybody's wondering, because this is a Beatles show. But I just want to touch upon a couple of things. First of all, something Andrew said in the very beginning. There is a distinction that you can make between what you think is the best year and also what's the most revolutionary. They may not go mm-hmm. hand in hand. It all depends upon your musical taste. And um, I wanted to ask all of you something, and I'll ask Steve this first. But because a lot of attention is given right now to 1965 being the groundbreaking year that it was, is it more important? Does something like that have more of an impact on us because it was the first time it was groundbreaking? Because you could certainly say, and I can relate this easily to the Beatles, you know, Rubber Soul was probably the first time there was a huge leap creatively in the songwriting um, on, on Beatles albums. And there was always a gradual um, progression going from Please Please Me through Help. But once you got to Rubber Soul, that was that big jump right there. But then you had the biggest climb ever, to me anyway, when they went into Revolver and Sgt. Pepper. So you can compare the initial groundbreaking to what might be considered the strongest as far as groundbreaking and and innovation. Does it matter to you uh, which has the biggest impact, the first time or whether or not they... They perfected things and finessed things and even brought it to higher levels later on. I think personally, I think, you know, back then it was the impact of the initial impact that hit everybody the hardest. I mean, going back to 64, it was, you know, the emergence of the Beatles that made the biggest splash, not only, you know, with the with the fans, but with the media, all the stuff that came after was kind of i'm mean, kind of added of course to the you know to the to their aura and added to their you know to their how great they were but the first time the first time really um was what got at everybody and and 65 had so many you know groundbreaking things um i was just watching the other night um on uh, direct tv for those of you that have direct tv there's an on demand with Brian Wilson and just listening, even listening to his band. And I had just seen the beach boys, you know, about a week before that, but listening to his band do all those old songs with Al Jardine, who's in the, who's playing with him. It's just astonishing. I mean, it's really, you know, because there's so many things he did that year and he, and, you know, I'm just using Brian Wilson as an, as an example. I mean, there were, there were so many other things going on you know, in 65. Um, but 65, 65 kind of added to everything. I mean, it was like, yeah, we had 64, but then you had 65, boom, 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 boom. And it was just one surprise after another. But again, I think the initial impact in 64, you know, was probably the biggest, but for, 
you know, I think more more now we look at the we look at the impact later on. But I think it, it, back then, you know, it was really the first time the the full impact of what was going on really wasn't that we didn't really look at it. Um, you know, back then we were just too busy listening to the music and listening, enjoying the transistor radios and, you know, listening to people like Cousin Brucey and, 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 uh, um, uh, Murray the K and everybody else, you know. So, I, I, Al, you feel that way? Absolutely. You know, in, in retrospect, we can tell that, for instance, you just mentioned Brian Wilson, that the side two of the Beach Boys today and side two of Summer Days and Summer Nights kind of set the stage for Pet Sounds. Uh, Dylan's Going Electric and the release of the Birds, Mr. Tambourine Man, uh, Mr. Tambourine Man LP, uh, set the stage for the Love and Spoonful and the Mamas and Papas and, uh, and all of the, of the folk rock acts that would emerge, uh, many of them during 1966. Things like that. The, uh, the, frankly, side two of Help, of the, you know, the British Help album, set the stage mm. for the, the musical advances that the Beatles would take on Rubber Soul. So there was a lot of, you know, kind of uh, development, you could say, of, of different aspects of the music that would, that would really burst forth in 66 and 67. But, um, uh, you know, I always say that you could put a, uh, you know, in terms of the, of the quality of the music, you could put a postage stamp over 64, 65, 66, maybe even 67, uh, because they're that close. It just, I just have a personal preference for 1965. Mm. Yeah, but getting back to my original question, do you think that because of that groundbreaking year of 65, and hey, let's face it, 64 was groundbreaking too. How do you even differentiate between 64 and 65 when you have the British invasion happening in 64? You have you were just talking about Motown in 65. Mm-hmm. Motown was huge in 64. It was the big year of the Supremes, most of all, you know, well, outside of the, the Beatles. Yeah. It was, I say the, it one, was, you know, I think the, the thing that you can really differentiate, the one thing is the lyrics in rock, which which actually this month is the month that folk rock really – exploded in a sense because you had well satisfaction which had anti-advertising lyrics you know inspired by dylan top of the charts all month mr tambourine man still hovering in the top five and then suddenly you had eve of destruction leak like around july 20th help comes out july 19th which was very introspective dylan like a rolling stone comes out the 20th love and spoonful comes out that same day do you believe in magic newport july 25th i think the lyrics is the one thing that in rock and roll, I mean, the people that Dylan had been doing great lyrics, but all acoustic in his folk little area, you know, in 64. So 65 seemed like, especially with like Eve of Destruction, number one, the first time mm. Al, you know, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the first time in the pop charts that kind of top, I guess, Blown in the Wind was a top hit too. But was that different? Like the lyrics being being at the top of the teenage pop charts? Yeah. Uh, folk rock kind of lyrics um i don't think it was the first i i I, i'm not i I, i'm just working from memory but i don't think it was the first time but let me i you know what i have a book in my lap that will probably tell me the answer so give me a few minutes and i will i will look and see um right i don't think blowing the wind got to number one uh it was a top five but i don't think it got number got to number one but uh, uh, I, I think even Destruction was the, the first record of that type of what they called protest music that uh, that actually did did reach number one on the, uh, you know, the national pop charts. Mm. Maybe. So maybe. Yeah, because I, when I was writing the book, it's hard to say 64. What was really different? So I was just wondering, maybe the lyrics was the most different thing in 65. As opposed to, because musically maybe there wasn't, you know, there's a lot of overlap with '64, but you guys would know better than me. Oh, though, for sure. Now, now you have to. One thing you have to remember. I mean, we should add that Andrew, and that's this is one of the amazing things about his book. Andrew is not one of us, uh, us dinosaurs. Uh, Andrew, 
<laughs> and Drew drew his like inspiration. Drew Andrew drew his inspiration for the book because of his father's in, um, enthusiasm for 1965 and, and the music of 65. Uh, and he did an amazing amount of research. I know how tough that is, uh, having mm. done you know my own book. But uh, he really kind of gets quote unquote the uh, the you know, the feel of 1965 but i think you know for like for those of us who actually did go through the year you know we couldn't really sense at the in real time the you know you know how much of an advance there was but it's like as i said it it, it seemed as if every day there was some new great record for instance i have in my hand the uh, biggest top 40 radio station in New York, uh, in, in the country by 1965, by the middle of 65, was WABC in New York. This mm-hmm. was their top 10 for this very week, 50 years ago. At uh, number 10 is I'm a Happy Man by the Jive Five, uh, actually a uh, kind of a, uh, a, a, a doo-wop group from the late 50s and early 60s with kind of an updated sound for that time. Uh, number nine is What's New Pussycat, Burt Backrack and Hal David's song, uh, the title song from the movie by Tom Jones, who, even though he's considered, you know, a pop artist, was at that point considered to be part of the, of the British invasion. Uh, number eight is For Your Love by the Yardbirds which was their breakthrough hit uh, written by Graeme Goldman. If this was the record that caused Eric Clapton to leave the Yardbirds uh, and to be replaced by Jeff Beck. And the Yardbirds are, you know, obviously have been a favorite uh, of, uh, of serious rock fans all along. Uh, number seven is Wooly Bully by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, a great example of uh, Tex-Mex music, a little bit of a novelty, but still. Great, great dance record. Number six was Yes, I'm Ready by Barbara Mason. One hit wonder, but a great R&B ballad. Uh, five is Caramia by Jay and the Americans. Uh, with uh, The lead singer of Jay and the Americans was uh, Jay Black, who has an operatic voice. And mm. uh, go to YouTube and look up the performance of this song on Shindig. Actually, it's on my, on my page from a couple of weeks ago. But uh, it's an incredible, incredible performance. Uh, number four is Mr. Tambourine Man by The Birds, the, 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 the record that, in effect, gave birth to, um, uh, to folk rock. Three is I'm Henry the Eighth I Am by Herman's Hermits. Uh, which, which is actually an old uh, British music hall song that Joe Brown used to perform. And uh, at that point, Herman's Hermits were extremely popular. Uh, uh, there was, they had a, you know, a big boom that spring, as did Freddie and the Dreamers, uh, as part of the, uh, the British invasion. Uh, number two is these in the opinion of a lot of people, the record of the summer of 65, I can't get no satisfaction. The record that really launched the Rolling Stones to the runner up position among really the world's uh, rock groups. And number one is a, is a certified Motown classic written and produced by Holland Dozier in Holland. Uh, I can't help myself by the four tops. So that's the top 10 from 50 years ago this week as you know, from WABC in New York on their uh, their All American Survey, and that's uh, courtesy of uh, Alan Sniffen's um, uh, New York Radio Message Board. I have the if you're anybody's interested, I have the mm-hmm. top top ten Billboard, which is a slightly different, right? Not entirely. Um, it's got several of the the songs, including. Uh, satisfaction and i can't help myself um i'll run it i'll run it down really quickly um 10 is uh jackie de shannon what the world needs now is love nine is just i'm ready barbara mason eight is crying in the chapel by elvis seven is seven sun by johnny rivers six is for your love five is wonderful world uh four is woolly bully three is her mr tambourine man two is satisfaction and one is can't help myself so it's slightly different. But uh, one thing that uh, when you mentioned Caramia, Al, do you remember uh, hearing 
I remember hearing Dan Ingram play Karamia on WABC and stretching out Jay Black's. Uh, um, oh, that last. Yes. That last <laughs> note. Yeah. Yes, yep. indeed. <laughs> That was just uh, hilarious. I mean, he stretched it. Must have stretched it out for a minute. It was great. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> anyway, sorry to, uh, but I mean, you know, it's it's so it's so cool to to go back and and I mean, you know, I I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I I, I I've and I've said this before that the music of today just does not compare to the music of of back then. Whether you want to talk about sixty four, sixty five. You know, sixty six. There's just no, there's just no comparison as far as. Well, I'm... remember that it's a completely different atmosphere now. It's a completely right. different music business. Also, the music right. isn't being directed at at dinosaurs like us. It's being, you know, as it's always been. It's being marketed toward teenagers, twenty somethings. You know, the quote unquote desired demographic. Mm-hmm. You know, so so there's no there's no way that we can really, um, you know, ha- get you know get much of a feeling for what's out there now. Just as our parents couldn't understand what uh, this, uh, you know, I can't get no satisfaction. What are all those dirty lyrics about uh, trying to get make some girl tell me, you know, whatever, you know, and uh, you know, it's always been pretty much like that. I I, I was. Th- well, I was wondering if one difference from today was, I wonder if it was, uh, did you guys experience this at the time? In retrospect, it seemed like there were so many social changes, you know, the civil rights, the war, anti-war movement, the pill, psychedelics, all kind of converging, even if they weren't explicitly in the lyrics or anything, it seemed like that there was a spirit that the music was sort of channeling, which I don't think today maybe gay rights, maybe civil rights a little bit, but I don't, doesn't seem like there's any kind of equivalent social transformation that's, that's taken music to a higher level in a sense these days. You know, so it seems a little bit more boring in a sense these days. You know? uh, right, well, a record like Eve of Destruction never would have gotten played in this in in today's atmosphere because it would have been felt, oh, no, you can't, uh, you know, this is too controversial. And so it never would have even made, uh, well, I sh- shouldn't say made air because now there's all these other alternatives. Yeah. Um, I just want to I just want to say a few things about radio in general. Please. I mean, it's very easy to, to look back and say those were the golden days. And believe me, I feel the same way as you guys. I think the 60s was such a golden era. And for me, I love the 70s, too. That's really more of my decade even right. more so than the 60s. But believe me, I treasure the 60s and appreciate the 60s more now than I ever have. But radio is s- such a different animal now because everything is so specialized. And there is music, I think, that can appeal to people that grew up in the 60s and 70s that's being played now. It's just not, from my taste, what's being played on the CHR contemporary hit radio mm-hmm. today. I think that that to me is garbage, and that's just my own personal opinion. I don't expect everyone else to agree, but you know, it's just that's what we grew up with. It was a time of incredible transformation, and the music really was powerful. It was at a time I think when Top Forty was was really blossoming as a format, and music was so eclectic, and it reflected that in in the Top Forty of the time. And that affected my musical taste more than anything else. The fact that you could hear a pop record, a rock record, a novelty record, a country record, an R&B record, all that on the same station. You could hear the Beatles and then Lorne Green doing Ringo and then (laughs) uh, (laughs) Dean Martin with Everybody Loves Somebody and then Motown, a Motown song, and then Roger Miller with Dang Me. You know, Mm -hmm. it's all on the same station. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's missing because you don't have that eclecticism on one format of radio unless it's a non-commercial station. So that affects the way that people are being brought up in our culture today. You have to listen to a specialized format to find the music that really appeals to you and that's if you want to go through all the trouble of hunting it down yourself young people a lot of people today don't necessarily listen to a radio station they try to find the music that they like just by going on the internet or or hearing what their friends are saying or file sharing and stuff like that Mm -hmm. so radio I don't think is the presence that it used to be and I think it's a really sad thing 
uh, I'm sorry I'm babbling on here, that we don't have we, we don't have the unified culture that we once did when we had fewer radio stations with bigger audiences all hearing the same thing. So it's easier to relate to that time when so many people all loved the same music or, or we all shared similar tastes, more similar tastes probably than more than now. So that's a huge difference. That radio plays such a big difference between the way it was then and the way it is now. Mm -hmm. Our culture is very different. It's a completely different landscape. And I want to be fair to today's music because there is a lot of good stuff that, that's coming out these days, but less people are hearing it because it's reaching smaller audiences because yeah. the, the formats are, are more specialized. Is that but, for the um, advertisers? Did they, they figure they could make more money like narrow casting and they could charge advertisers more? Is that why it changed the radio? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, yeah. The, the advertisers want to know their demographic audience, and the music that they program is supposed to reflect what they think is their demographic audience. So as long as they're appealing to that audience, then they'll get advertising. So, so advertising um, yeah. diminished music for everyone in a way, in a strange way. Well, there always was advertising to begin with. Listen to Top 40 Radio back then. My God, oh my you know goodness. how many commercials were on in one hour? There were, there were commercials after every song. Oh yeah, yeah, I just meant that. I guess for the for our for them chasing the advertising dollar, that's what broke us into smaller niche audiences. It doesn't get the eclectic, big 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 stations like you were talking about before. You know, but uh, mm. it's true. But anyway, I can pick probably any any week in from 1964 through 69. If we're talking the 60s, any week, look at the top ten and go, oh my god. Yeah. Look at all those exactly. songs and, mm -hmm. and think that just about every single one of them is great. So, um, you know, getting back to what I was saying before, I want to just compare 64 to 65 as years because I know, Steve, you said there's nothing that can compare to 1964 for you, mm -hmm. certainly as a Beatle fan. But other than the lyric changes and everything else that you mentioned, why wouldn't you think 1964 was just as revolutionary because we... Look, the biggest change in 64 was the Beatles and the British invasion, you know, really? by far. That really affected so much. Why, why wouldn't you put that in the same category as 65? Well, I didn't. Uh, I, uh, now you're I'm saying this to all of you. I'm saying this oh, to all okay. of you, not just you, Steve. I did say a few weeks ago that I thought if I had to pin down a year, 64 was the year because of because basically of the Beatles, but there were so many great things happening, you know, year by year by year. I mean, you know, I mean, it was just one thing after another, one surprise after another, uh, you know, um, you had all the great stuff happening this year. Uh, um, you had the who starting uh, coming in. I mean, you had all the Beatles things that, that happened in 65, um, you know, um, but I mean, there were just, there were just things from year to year going on and it was, you know, we never knew what was going to come down, and everything that was coming down was exploding against the establishment because the establishment didn't know what the hell was going on with the kids. So, you know, today's a, today's a little different because the establishment and and the youth culture have intertwined so much more than they did back then. You know, there were things were separated back then very much, uh, and adults really looked down on what kids were doing. So, you know, I think that things are a, a lot different today than they are than they were back then. But there were just so many great things happening from week to week, and you had, you know, you had the the, the great radio stations. The radio culture had a lot to do with it. Because radio culture, as you said, is a lot different now, uh, now than it is then. There was there. I think there's actually more influence in radio back then. Uh, I, I can you probably might. I don't know if you're going to agree with that or not. But I mean, I think the historically, if you look back at history, I think uh, when you had some of the great DJs that we had, you know, they oh yeah they um, they nailed it as far as you know. Uh, leading the pack as far as what was going on, you know, so um, you don't see many, you don't see DJs doing that. I mean, you have, you know, you have DJs like on Sirius and stuff doing, you know, uh, playing music, but there certainly isn't the the power and the influence that we had back in the 60s at all. Um, oh, I totally, I totally agree with you there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, if you like the top 40 format, that, that period of the 60s and 70s, and I can't really relate to the 50s there. I love the 50s music. I don't really know radio from the 50s mm. that well. Um, but, yeah, the DJs mattered. People went to concerts in part to see their DJ introducing sure. some of the acts that were on stage. And that, you know, as far as DJs that actually played music, you don't really have that now. On, on most radio stations, you have a morning team that's like right. a comedy team, and that's about mm -hmm. it for personality. Most personality yeah. is on talk radio. It's on talk radio now. Right. So um, I'm not saying there aren't some select examples in the country, but um, that was at a time when personality mattered and the way you delivered and talked up a song, and you know, certain jocks had their own style that made them their own, whereas gradually radio became less personality driven for music stations and they cared more about playing music and have less talk mm -hmm. so um yeah i definitely agree with you on that steve the djs certainly you know i can only talk about new york because that's what i listen to but the djs that i grew up with on wabc in the 60s and 70s were the greatest to me <laughs> they're my heroes you mm -hmm. know so um yeah i totally agree but the the music the mu getting back to the music of 65 i mean we had such a um and upswelling of, of, you know, incredible things going on. The number one song on the first day of January was I Feel Fine, believe it or not. And the number one song the last week of December was Over and Over by the Dave Clark Five, which actually, Over and Over is probably a bad example of, you know, influential songs. Mm, but yeah. I mean, but but there are, there are so many, I mean... Uh, the ones on either side, I think, we, we can work it out and sound of silence. We're on either side of over and over. Yes. I think those are g going towards probably what it sounded like you're going, you're heading towards, you know, with the yeah. contrasting the beginning yeah. and the end of the year. Well, that's mm -hmm. that same, that same week at the end of December, you also had in the top 10, let's hang on by the four seasons, England swings, which I, which, uh, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to uh, talking about uh, eclecticism. I Can Never Go Home Anymore by the Shangri-Las, which I absolutely adore. Uh, you know, I mean, that, uh, and, and yeah, We Can Work It Out was number 11 that week. So you had, you know, you had all sorts of things going on. I mean, you had, the, 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 just talk about the Shangri-Las. I mean, they were, you know, they had a hell of an influence on, on not only on guys, but on, on pop culture. I mean, I remember adoring them back in the, in the 60s. Um, Ah, uh, I won't. Let's not even go there. I mean, they were they were fantastic. They really were. That music is just is just uh, something else. And there were just so many there were so many good things happening in music that year. I mean, it was it was it was great stuff. It, it's hard to nail down one thing, you know. You, you can almost show the Beatles their number one singles shows like a really interesting arc because it yes. goes, I feel fine eight days a yeah. week, then suddenly Ticket to Ride help gets darker than yesterday, pretty heavy, and then we can work it out. It kind of, uh, they, they kind of definitely had a, a arc going that year, a growth progression. That's right. Pretty, they, mm -hmm. they, were, they were getting a lot more serious in 65. Uh, they weren't the, they, they were still the Fab Four. Um, I mean, they that wouldn't leave until, you know, start fading out until next year until 66 but they were they were getting a lot more serious it was you know it wasn't i want to hold your hand anymore so and they were there was there was even as big as herman's hermits were in that spring and summer as big as uh freddie and the dreamers were for a short time in that that spring as big as satisfaction and the last time and get off of my cloud were for the for the for the rolling stones there was never a doubt at any point in that year who the biggest group in the pop world was mm -hmm. you know i mean the the shea stadium the the first concert at shea stadium sold out via word of mouth you know, there those posters that you've seen that are out there with Sid Bernstein presents. Those are fakes. There were there were actually, in fact, Dave Schwenson, uh, who we're hoping to get on the on the show very soon, um, mm -hmm. has pointed that out. That those those po those posters didn't exist until afterward. Hmm. That because because uh, Brian had uh, Brian Epstein had pretty much stipulated that there be no overt promotion 
for that concert at Shea Stadium. So it basically sold out through word of mouth and uh, Top 40 Radio. Mm-hmm. And well, uh, Top 40 you know, Radio was Top 40 Radio was was so so huge. I mean, just exactly. the mention of that on a station like WABC, and you know it's going to sell out quickly. Right. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, but also, but if it had, if it had been any other group, uh, there were no guarantees that a, a show like that would have sold out, mm-hmm. especially without any overt, uh, you know, uh, any overt promotion. But that's how huge the Beatles were. And and but then the next year they fact, didn't sell out, right? They it, it, it they was didn't like that sell year out. Was their pinnacle. Yeah, the, Maybe the 66. Jesus, ooh, ha, ha, 66. Right. That and, and also, you know, a lot of the, you know, the original girl fans were by that time three years older and were, you know, had kind of moved on from wanting to go to, you know, go to shows and scream and leave wet seats and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, but there was, you know, they, in fact, 1965, in, in 1965, the Beatles were never again as universally popular as they were in 1965. And there was never a moment's doubt uh, that they were the biggest pop act in the world. You know, the following year, all the, the controversies began and then the drug revelations and things like that. Uh, and even some fan resistance to Revolver and Sgt. Pepper, some of the, you know some of the younger fans, as Candy Leonard has gone into in her book, uh, Beatleness. Uh, but in '65, they were still absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, the biggest pop act in the world. See, that's one thing I would question you on, Al, because, yeah, I, I know they sold out Shea, they sold out everywhere in 65. 66 was a different story, which is hard for me to admit, considering mm-hmm. these are the Beatles we're talking about, but also the Beatles being bigger than Jesus, quote, had a lot to do with uh, loss of sales, concert ticket sales. Um, mm-hmm. But still, if you look at the charts from year to year, every Beatles album just about went to number one. You know, they still had number one singles, so it's not like I would say that they really took a dive in any way after 65. Well, only uh, when I'm talking about universal popularity, you know, because Mm. in 66, you know, you had uh, you had all especially that, you know, what I call the summer in hell, you know, from the uh, from the butcher cover to the Jesus controversy to Manila uh, and and all the rest of us. What? I'm sorry. Oh, they had, didn't they uh, have death threats in Japan too for playing? Right. Yeah. The... Exactly. So, uh, so you know, and and also there was there was some resistance by some of the younger fans who were not really that musically sophisticated to the advances in Rubber Soul and especially Revolver and then Sgt. Pepper. So, right. uh, you know, so they never were again as universally popular. As they were in the monkeys came in, right? The monkeys came in 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 '66. Yeah, and and a lot of the yeah, a lot of those younger uh, girl fans, particularly, kind of uh, took the monkeys to their uh, uh, to their hearts because they were, you know, their music was more accessible to them than Tomorrow Never Knows. Mm -hmm. Oh, that 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 just. Reminded me of another when you Ken, you were mentioning how is sixty five I really how good sixty four was just as you know uh, revolutionary which on some level I obviously totally agree with I would say one other difference might be sixty five was when the British art school rockers like the Kinks and the Yard well I don't know if the Yardbirds per se were an art school but they started playing trying to imitate a sitar with the uh, you know uh, the the fuzz pedal. You know, the, the mm-hmm. beginnings of psychedelia where they started, they, they had mastered the blues and the rock forms in 64. And now they were trying, they were kind of using their artsy minds to, you know, get a, start getting psychedelic, you know, the, the glimmers of it. Right. Oh, there's, there's exactly. no doubt in my mind that there, there, there were so many changes being made in the music in terms of lyrics, in terms of the production, the instrumentation. 65 was an enormous year of advancement there. Uh, you know, the only thing I come back to as a question is, 
does that make it the best year? It might oh, be yeah, the most well, interesting I, year. I mean, I, uh, I, I, you know, just have a personal preference for 1965. I think there were, you know, just for me, there were more great records that uh, that I particularly liked. You know, but I'm, you know, I, I'm not saying that it's a be all and end all, but uh, that 1965 is the greatest year. But uh, I would put it up against, uh, you know, any any other year in the 60s kind of record for record, because, as I said, you, you know, you could go to you know, I read off that top 10 from this week. You could go to the top 10 or top 20. Uh, on almost any top 40 radio station or the national charts for virtually any week that year. And you'll see just the the number of what we would now consider classic records is, Mm. is, is mind boggling, absolutely Mm. mind boggling. Uh, The difference between you, you, you've brought up a couple of times, the difference between 64 and 65, just that 64 was a transitional year. Where, but 65 is really where, as I mentioned before, those bands that kind of began to formulate in the wake of the Beatles' first impact uh, in America really kind of came to the fore in 65. Uh, and that includes the birds, as a matter of fact. And then you, you know, you you uh, uh, you bring Dylan's um, entrance into the rock arena. Uh, in in there as well, uh, along with the you know there uh, obviously Motown Motown's kind of golden era you could you know say began either in sixty three or sixty four but in, but it was in sixty five that it really went into hyperdrive so right. and and the and the first the first major hits out of stacks. From Otis Redding, from uh, uh, Wilson Pickett, even though he was technically not on stacks, uh, but recorded there, uh, and um, uh, so much more that went into you know what I call the sort of the musical stew that was 1965. Right, and a lot of great albums too. In a way, it was mm-hmm. the beginning of the album era with Dylan's two mm-hmm. albums that year and Rubber Soul and the Who's album, and, uh, Bird's album. Really, uh, the album and as a ma- form really kicked in. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, uh, we're recording this j- the day after the Grateful Dead played their what they say is their final concert at Soldier Field in Chicago. And as uh, Andrew points out in, in his book, uh, it was 50 years ago uh, that the Grateful Dead formed in uh, uh, in San Francisco. Actually, and so actually, that was... actually, Palo Alto, to get tech. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and and some of the other personalities who would uh, who would emerge from the San Francisco scene also were beginning to get involved. Uh, Grace Slick uh, was the lead singer with a group called the Great Society that was playing the ballrooms and such in in San Francisco at that point. So, uh, so yeah, as Andrew said, kind of the album rock era uh, was both on the surface and below was really beginning in 1965. So, uh, so you know, whereas 64 was this great transitional year, uh, 65 is where so much of the music began to really emerge. Mm. Right. Okay. How would you compare this to, say... Um, I don't want to exclude 1966, but 1967 is looked upon, certainly in radio, as the important year when when rock music was really changing and albums became the art form. And you had, you know, the classic albums like Sgt. Pepper and Surrealistic Pillow and Jimi Hendrix's first album and The Doors, you know, for for classic rock radio. They rarely ever play anything pre-1967 unless there's a specific reason behind it. But as far as music that relates to what's going on today in classic rock radio, it seems to start in 1967. Mm-hmm. That, that's yeah, actually, and, and well, that that was no, the thing ahead. that I love about '65 is because in a way it it has its feet in both camps because a lot of the music sounds like what you call oldies music today, you know, like a. But then 
you have like with the Yardbirds and all that, that the beginning of that classic rock sound. So that, that's what always fascinated me with the year was that it was sort of the year that the classic 67 sound started kind of ever, emerging from the, the era of like you were mentioning Jay and the Americans and the Vogues mm -hmm. and the four seasons and everything. It's like an overlap of those two things, which I really enjoy. I think I think mm -hmm. there there were groups though from pre sixty seven that got a lot of attention, that um, you know uh, Simon the Beatles of course Simon and Garfunkel, you know uh, the Birds obviously, so I think I think there were a number of pre sixty seven groups Paul Revere and the Raiders are another one, so I mean there's a uh, and Good Vibrations came out in sixty six so. You know, there was a lot of good music in '66. The thing about '66, though, is that it took it it took what had been, you know, had already happened in '64 and '65, and just really built on on what had already come. And I think if you're going to characterize '66, it's it's really the progression year. I mean, an incredible progression. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. evolved like crazy in 66. They didn't really, I think that's what the problem, if there's a, you know, if you want to say something about 65, things were still just getting started in 65, where in, in 66, everything just took off, you know. Right. right. In, just... 60, in 66, you've got, you know, you, you've got the Mamas and Papas, if you can believe your eyes and ears. Uh, you've got Dylan's Blonde on Blonde. You've got the Beach Boys, Pet Sounds. You've got the first Rascals album. You've got Revolver. Mm -hmm. Just those five Aftermath. alone. After, right. Yes, thank you. Aftermath. Right. Blonde on Blonde. So, mm -hmm. yeah, right. Exactly. And so when you have just just a, a you know just a few classic albums of uh, of that ilk, along with you know many others, it's uh, you know it's it, it's it was a monumental uh, monumental year. Absolutely. Mm. So like I said, I mean, you could put a postage stamp over uh, 65 and 66 in terms of the quality of the music. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how that's how close it is. You know, as I said, I just happen to have a personal preference for 65. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there's, uh, I'm just running down a list here of some of the records of 65. And I mean, there are so many deep cuts that are so that were so much fun to listen to. The Jolly Green Giant is is one. Right. Um, the Kingsman. The Kingsman. Yeah, that's another one. Um, I'm just running. I'm just running down a list here. Um, Let's lock the door. That's another great Jay and the American song. Have you heard? Have you have you seen Jay uh, perform lately, um, Al? I haven't myself because he mostly he's kind of semi retired now, mm -hmm. and he mainly um, he mainly performs either out on Long Island mm -hmm. uh, in Ken Ken's old stomping grounds uh, mm -hmm. or in Florida, you know, for the retirees. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's from all reports, he still has that you know near <laughs> operatic voice. Amazing! Yeah, I I've seen him. I've seen him a number of times actually. He yeah, still he's... sounds great. He really okay. does. Yeah. I don't think he holds on to that that long note in Caramia like he used to. But right. uh, no, <laughs> he could still he could still sing great for a full hour. And uh, no, his voice is still in great shape. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some somebody else to to mention is Chad and Jeremy, who do still sound absolutely freaking fantastic. I mean yeah, that that is. Uh, I, ad I admit I have not seen them. I d have not seen them recently. I did see them a while back, and they just blew me over how good they sounded. Um, it's it's amazing, and uh, yeah, I you know I, I was I was very lucky to talk to uh, to uh, Chad Stewart uh, about a year ago, and he, it was fantastic talking to them. One of my favorite moments is that Dick Van Dyke show. I love that Dick Van Dyke show. Sure, um, <laughs> that is. One a show I could watch over and over and over again, and of course it's all parallel. It's all Beatles parallel in there. So um, sure, of course. But uh, I yeah. mean, there's there's just so many. Oh God, those uh, you know when you talk about Unit Four Plus Two, Concrete and Clay, even even Freddie and the Dreamers. For I you know I thought uh, I I've seen going through billboard uh archives uh billboard ads from 65 and i'd forgotten that freddie and the dreamers actually got launched in 65 not in 64 and well it, here 
they had their, you know, they, their, their, their boom is in 65. But for instance, I'm telling you now, which was a, their number one record in, in the U.S. in the spring of 65, actually had been a number two single in England in the fall of 63. And a record called She Loves You kept them out of the number one spot in, mm-hmm. in, in, on the English charts. So, they, and, and You Were Made For Me, the follow-up was also from that same, from that same time. Do you know they did, a, they did an album of Disney covers? Fre- uh, Freddie and James? Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Uh, uh, I, I believe the album is, is on CD for anybody interested. But yeah, they did an album of Disney covers. It's unbelievable. Is that after the Beatles turned down uh, Jungle Book? Didn't they base those vultures on the Beatles and the Jungle Book? But uh, John Lennon... Yeah, I, 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 would, I would assume so, yeah. And that is indeed a true story. That uh, in case, you know, for anybody that hasn't heard that, that is true. That the uh, the vultures were based on the Beatles. I couldn't believe that when I first heard it, and it was like, really? And uh, but uh, actually, was it was it a few? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, several years ago, they had a uh, Disneyland had a thing called America Sings. This is way way back it's gone it's long gone now but they had the vultures in america sings um <laughs> and um so anyway but i just want to say um i've seen chad and jeremy many times and mm-hmm. several years ago they mm-hmm. reunited for the first time in a long time and they sound exactly the same as they did in the 60s mm-hmm. i mean it's oh, like yeah. time has stood still with chad and jeremy so mm-hmm. if you ever get a chance they only do a few dates here and there but whenever they do perform go see them and there's one other band that we haven't mentioned. I'm sure there are others, but the Zombies are a band that, mm-hmm. you know, they were ahead of their time, really, because they mixed rock with jazz elements. Yeah, and, exactly. And uh, they are still going strong. They're still making new music. They're still touring, and they're phenomenal. They really are. Anyone who gets a chance should see the Zombies. Colin Blundstone, the lead singer, sounds mm-hmm. phenomenal. You know, he's 70 years old now, and he's got a voice of an angel. Rod Argent is still a tear right there on the keyboards. So, uh, yeah. Bobby Fuller, four. I fought the law. Uh, yeah. Well, that was actually 66. Go ahead. There, no, that go was ahead. funny. When I was writing the book, there are so many things. There were like December 65. They were, they say that some right. people say they were released. Some people say not. So, yeah. I don't yeah. Who knows? I guess. They may have been released in December, but then they, but they really, really didn't become hits until maybe the late winter or early spring of 66. There's a great clip of, of Bobby Fuller, Fuller on Hullabaloo that, that I know is on YouTube. That right. is well worth mm-hmm. is well worth catching. That is absolutely yeah. amazing. And since we're talking mm-hmm. about 66 music, another clip to to dig out on YouTube is the original music video for These Boots Are Made for Walking, which is right. absolutely a scream. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Well, we've just about we ran we've run out of time here actually because uh, I can't believe this hour has just flown by. It has. But uh, Andrew, we want to thank you for for being a great guest with us on the show. Um, once happy. again, um, the name of your book is called "1965: 1965, The Most Revolutionary Year in Music." You also wrote a book on the solo Beatles, which we didn't mention before, which is called "Still the Greatest: The Essential Songs of the Beatles Solo Careers." Maybe we'll have you on to talk about that. Oh. Um- Love to any time, and the, there's websites for both books, 1965book.com and solobeatles.com. You also did a, uh, a Where's Waldo uh, Beatle book, didn't you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's where – that one – the other books are all text, but there's a book called Where's Ringo that's got a, uh, 20 illustrations where you have to find Ringo and all these other Beatles-related pop culture things. And Here then, we go. Uh, yeah, I wrote, the, I wrote the accompanying text, and some great artists did all the pictures. Mm. Yes, I've I've seen that book. That's a wonder. That's a wonderful book. It's a it's a, a great book for a gift. So, so Andrew, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I just want to mention, uh, if you can, please check out my own website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. There's a couple of new interviews that are on there. One is with Adam Ippolito, the keyboardist from Elephant's Memory, and we were mentioning Dave Schwenson before, who we're, ho- we're hoping to have on the show. He's got a new book out, The Beatles at Shea Stadium. So new interviews there on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. 
I probably should put in a plug since we've been discussing 1965 that what I do is each day I put in one of the 365 reasons why 1965 is the greatest year in the history of rock and roll uh, on my Facebook page, which is under Al Sussman, or you can access it on Twitter uh, at asus49. You actually put one song in there, Al, that I was very pleased that you posted. Which that one? being, of course, the clapping song from Shirley <laughs> Ellis. <laughs> hey, hey, three six nine, the goose drank wine. <laughs> Where do you find <laughs> like that? Come on, the monkey chew tobacco. Well, we're trying to cover the whole spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hey, I said novelty records too. They were a big Absolutely. part of the sixties. Yeah. Soupy and. He, that's right, the mouse. Right. That was sixty-five, right? Uh, April. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Hey, he was yes. on with the Beatles. That's yeah, Sullivan. That's that's true. Yeah. And if people want to get in touch with you, Steve, they could do so. How? Uh, Beatles Examiner at Gmail dot com. Uh, and I'm also uh, I have uh, my own personal Facebook page, and I also hang around the Beatles News and Commentary group pages a group page and i hang around a lot of places but those are the best places to find me you can always uh, uh message me um either by email or uh, on pm on facebook and i'll be glad to reply okay and if you want to get in touch with all of us at the show our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com all right on behalf of steve marinucci al sussman in absentia, Alan Cozen, and Andrew Grant Jackson. This is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.